Wetlands are often taken for granted. We met them here and will leave them, but not as we found them in the first place. In small islands like ours, we often overlook them and scarcely pay mind to the connection between wetlands and us. The area known as the Buku Reef along with the Bonacord Lagoon complex has been designated as a wetland of international importance under the Ramsar Convention since 2005. This means that it's of significant value for the island and the world. The area has long been an important part of the migratory pattern for birds from North America. It's a staple site in the tourism sector, attracting visitors to take a dip in the meter-deep nylon pool, enjoy bird watching in the lagoon, or see over 40 species of corals at the reef's coral gardens. It also provides people with employment through the fishing industry. So even if we don't appreciate the natural beauty, then we should seek to conserve it for its economic value to our lives. It should be protected firstly because of its unique natural features. It's the only fringing reef in the Caribbean and it's also the best example of our contiguous seagrass, coral reef and mangrove wetland system in Trinidad and Tobago. The area is also rich in biodiversity and they also have rare species such as the seahorse which can be found in the seagrass beds and you have resident species such as the spiny lobster, the green turtle, and the queen conch. The area is home to over 40 species of coral and over 100 species of fish. And the Bonacord Lagoon acts as the nursery for the reef and also commercially important species of fish, uh, they spawn there. So it helps to support the fishing industry in Tobago. A fringing reef like the one at the Buku Reef Bonacord Lagoon complex grows near the coastline around islands and is separated from the shore by narrow, shallow lagoons. This Ramsar site covers 1,287 hectares. It is the only one with that designation on the island, but not the only one that needs protection. In Tobago, all wetlands are owned by the state, meaning that the areas are not under private ownership. Under the fifth schedule of the Tobago House of Assembly Act, the THA is the organization responsible for the management and the preservation of those lands. By definition, there are areas covered in water that's static, flowing, fresh, brackish or salt that can be permanent or temporary that does not exceed 6 meters at low tide. Taking that meaning into consideration, Tobago has more than 20 natural and man-made wetland sites. Mainly, the, the ones we recognize most or tend to um, identify most as wetlands are the, the mangrove swamps, right? We have here at, at Buku, right? Also at um, yeah, Buku Bonacord, also at Pitichu, then there's Kilgrin, those are some of the larger areas, right? We also have some marsh areas. Right. Most recognizable is here at Buku as well, the Buku Marsh. You know, we also have some at um, yeah, Study Park, uh, Granby area there, we have some marshes as well, and some other areas, but those are the two main types. Other wetlands include the Black Rock Pond and rivers and streams such as those at the Corland Bay. The most prominent man-made wetland on the island is the plantation Magdalena Ponds. Wetlands are often seen as smelly places to avoid, and sometimes they are dumping grounds for garbage, as people don't understand the critical role they play in our survival. Over the decades, these ecosystems have been degraded or wiped out entirely due to commercial and tourism development, overfishing, illegal hunting, land clearing and erosion, water pollution from domestic waste, and siltation due to agricultural and quarrying activities. What I've learned so far, which is more or less like a refresher for me, is the different types of wetlands and especially the importance of the wetland. What was a bit negative is the, um, the dumping. 
We know that this wetland is so important to us and to see so much dumping taking place here is really um, heartrending. People tend to not regard wetlands very highly or so it has been historically, right? And so they will see these places, they go down there, there's a strong scent of um, this kind of rotten egg scent from the, scent from the um, hydrogen sulfide. They say, ah, let's fill over that place with, with, with dirt and backfill it and, you know, make valuable land not knowing that the wetlands themselves are very valuable. Well, that, that is long ago, we think, right? Or we'd expect, right? And they used to be used as a dump. Also, um, in terms of uh, the, the, the wood material, it's very strong because remember, these things are growing in, in salt water or brackish water. So they are very sturdy and could withstand, you know, a lot of um, weather conditions and so forth. So they used to be used a lot in that regard, also for fire, what do you call it, coal, so for fuel. It used to be used cutting down the mangroves for, in the name of development. That often happens. You, know, you see a nice beach area and there's some mangrove there, you want to build a big facility. First thing, you cut down the mangrove to put um, some kind of, you know, permanent structure. You know, those things are not really sensible. But in order to sustain our lives, we have to protect the wetlands. And one way of starting the awareness of their importance is educating our young ones about this part of their natural environment. We always know that it's important to target children. Because if you educate them when they are young, the information would, I mean, stay with them. And if not stay with them, but you know that at least you're targeting them at a young age. And we are hoping now that when they get this information, they're going to put it into practice and maybe take it home so that they, their parents and everybody would benefit from what education we, we, we try to offer. The first thing I think is, is education and awareness. Right? raising the education and awareness of our population. Well, today we have here yeah, school children. I think that's where we should begin, to instill within them that, um, that natural love for the environment so that they'll protect it. Granted also that <laughs> our economy is looking toward tourism as the mainstay going forward. That becomes very essential if we are to be sustainable in that, in that regard. In celebration of World Wetlands Day, Children from schools such as the Bonacord Government Primary School and the Patience Hill Government Primary School got a first-hand experience of some types of wetlands in Tobago when they visited the mangrove swamps and beaches at Kilgwin and Buku. The educational school tours are done by the Tobago House of Assemblies Division of Food Production, Forestry and Fisheries in collaboration with Environment Tobago. Do you know that, that mangroves, they are able to absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere at a very quick rate? Well, I don't think that you would have known that, right? But yes, they are able to take carbon dioxide from the air and make it into sugar, right? So that the animals can feed on it and get energy from that source, right? If you notice, there are a lot of leaves around. You notice how many leaves? Yes. Right, because the leaves, they convert so solar energy into sugar at a very fast rate. And then that sugar now becomes available to the fish and other animals, crabs and so forth, that live in the mangrove. At first glance, wetlands appear to be areas with only vegetation and water. But a careful examination reveals that they camouflage and support a variety of wild animals, such as birds, fishes, reptiles, crustaceans, and insects. Of course, many different kinds of um, organisms live in the mangroves, right? Or in wetlands generally, right? So in that regard, as a, as a reserve for, for biodiversity, they serve as that. And well, leading on from that, a lot of the species that grow there, we use, as humans, we use crabs, you know, Tobago, we like crab, crab and dumpling and so forth. Mangrove, is a, is, that's the habitat, that's the main habitat, right? Um, reptiles such as lizards, snakes, etc. So fisheries in particular, they, they serve as a nursery for, for fish, 
reef fish as well as deep sea fish, pelagics, right? The pelagics, they come in, lay their eggs, the juveniles, they grew up in the, in, the, in the lagoon spaces where they could have protection between the roots of the mangrove as well as food from the leaves and so forth before they go back out into the reefs and even further out, right? So if we destroy the mangroves, we can expect to see a decrease in fish population. There are approximately 24 native species of birds to the wetlands. They include the great blue heron, yellow-crowned night heron, anhinga, and the black-bellied whistling duck. Shorebirds like the mangrove cuckoo, snowy egret, and the purple gallinule stay around the edges of freshwater wetlands, mangroves, and swamps. There are also thousands of migratory birds that visit for food and warmer weather conditions. The migratory waterfowls, like the white-cheeked pintails, are attracted to large bodies of open fresh water. And then there are those rare migratory birds that are found in swamps and mangroves, such as the prothonotary warbler and the chestnut-sided warbler. Even the scarlet ibis has been sighted on a few occasions by avid bird watchers. Very valuable to us is the birds in terms of the tourism sector, right? Tobago is known as one of the uh, better bird watching destinations in this part of the world, right? So wetlands are a significant habitat in that regard as well. For example, we're here at Buku. A lot of the migratory birds that go from North America to South America, they often stay off here, you know, rest and feed before they continue on their journey, right? And so a lot of people are, are familiar with the, the bird watching potential of Tobago, so they come here to, to view to view our, our very unique um, situation here. The clear, pristine waters that people enjoy at beaches such as Pigeon Point and Buku wouldn't be possible without the wetland systems. That's because they act as a natural filter for man-made runoff such as sewage, pesticides, fertilizers, and household waste water. The wetlands, they do a very essential service in protecting the reef and even supplying food to the organisms on the reef, right? Waters coming from inland, upon passing through the wetland, the sediments in the water, they filter because the water slows down, giving the, the sediments an opportunity to settle. And also there's nutrients in the water, a lot of nitrates and even phosphates, some things like or, or soaps and so forth that get into the system. The mangroves use that as nourishment, so they, they absorb a lot of these things. So by the time the water gets on the seaside or into the sea, it's much cleaner. But those things are not really good for the reefs, right? So it serves that purpose. The wetlands are well managed, you know, it helps to reduce the impact of all these pollutants, pesticides and so on, going to the seagrass beds and afterwards going further out, reaching the reef. And it can cause deterioration of the reefs, you know, um, you can have alkyl bloom because of the number, of the, the amount of nutrients, what we call nutrients in the water. You find that they're completely taken over by algae. The algae now smother the corals and then the corals can't live or breathe or get sufficient light in what is necessary for them, clear, clean water. The theme used for World Wetlands Day 2017 was Wetland for Disaster Risk Reduction. The title points to the importance of conserving wetlands and keeping them healthy, since they help reduce the damage caused by erosion, natural disasters and climate change. It also protects us um, in terms of like waves and like um, conditions as a result of climate change and hurricanes, storms and so forth. The, the heavy waves coming, they tend to protect the land from eroding and also in situations like tidal waves, we learn, right? Areas that, are, that have wetlands close to them, adjacent to them, are less impacted by those kind of um, events. Right? So they serve as to protect in those two ways, from erosion of the coast and also from climate-related disasters. Mangrove help animals that live in wetlands, like birds, they nest on the trees and the fishes come to nurse in the wetlands. 
I learned that the black mangroves grew in dry areas and the red mangroves grew in wet swamps, campy areas. I learned today that marshes have grasses and swamps have trees. I learned that the black mangrove would have roots coming up from the ground. Piece of it is up above the ground and piece of it would be under because the piece that is under would be in water and has no air. So the parts above would get it some air. Research on the Buku Reef Bonacord Lagoon is a major part of the work done by the Buku Reef Trust. It's a non-profit organization established in 1999 that seeks to educate, research and to conserve this area. We put a lot of effort into researching corals, even assessing the coral bleaching phenomena that we had in 2005, you know, after this serious global warming thing. The oceans warmed to about 30 degrees, you know, so that was too much for the, the coral reefs. We did a big survey and study of that whole system and the impact of that coral bleaching event. There are other research efforts that we did, you know, in terms of um, working in the mangrove, identifying the state of the mangrove and so on, developing flyers, you know, telling people, making people aware of the mangrove and the wetlands, you know, because there's a direct connection between the wetlands and the seagrass bed and the reef, in particular with Buku Reef. The creation and enforcement of proper legislation is another avenue for the preservation of our wetlands. When the Ramsar Convention came into force in Trinidad and Tobago in 1993, it meant that the country had to implement certain measures which will conserve wetlands such as the Buku Reef Bonacord Lagoon Complex, the Karuni Swamp, and the Nariva Swamp in ways that will maintain their ecological character and retain their essential functions and values for future generations. In keeping with the convention, the country created a policy document entitled National Policy and Programs on Wetland Conservation for Trinidad and Tobago, which was approved by Cabinet in 2001. It outlines programs in the areas of education, training, and management that are to be used in the preservation of wetlands. Even before the signing of the Ramsar Convention, the Buku Reef Marine Park, which is the area that covers approximately 7 square kilometers in the southwest of Tobago, was and still is a restricted area protected by law under the Marine Areas Preservation and Enhancement Act 1970. The existing legislation, the Marine Areas Preservation and Enhancement Act, declares that no person can remove any flora or fauna from the Boko Reef Marine Park. And this responsibility is carried out by our reef patrol officers who conduct patrols to make sure that persons are adhering to the regulations and also to ensure that the area is sustainably utilized. Tour operators are granted permission to take visitors snorkeling at the reef's coral gardens, then to no man's land, the Bonacord Lagoon, and the Nylon Pool. But there are instances where people use the area for jet skiing, parties, and loud music, activities that are not permitted. The Tobago House of Assembly would have granted permission to the reef tour operators to conduct reef tours only. So this permission has been granted. Um, however, we have noticed that persons are conducting other activities in addition to the standard reef tours. And these are the type of activities that we are not allowing to take place. So party activities are strictly prohibited within the Boko Reef Marine Park. It is a protected area and a very sensitive environment. And as such, these activities are not allowed to take place there. When you have uh, large numbers of persons, it exceeds the environmental carrying capacity. And also you have to consider garbage and garbage disposal, particularly with respect to plastics and the damage that this could do to marine life. Turtles particularly tend to get caught in, in plastics and plastic bags and they ingest it as well and causes um, disturbances to the digestive tract of the animal. There aren't specific laws protecting the wetlands, but there are over 20 pieces of legislation that can be linked to the conservation of wetlands. 
they can be used to impose fines and to curb the negative impact on these areas. Under the Conservation of the Wildlife Act, Chapter 6701, which was established in 1958, individuals are only allowed to hunt in the wetlands with a license for specific wild game during the hunting season. That period starts on October 1st and runs until the end of February of the next year. The closed season allows animals to reproduce and replenish their population so as to maintain a balance in the ecosystem. And for those found dumping in the wetlands, they can be fined under the Litter Act 1973. The burning of materials in the wetlands is also prohibited. Then there's the Environmental Management Act Chapter 3505 of 2000. Out of that came the establishment of the Environmental Management Authority. That body is responsible for the protection, wise use, and enhancement of the environment. Despite the laws and the enforcement, or lack thereof, individuals are required to use their discretion. Stop dumping in the mangroves. Don't throw it at the mangroves. Throw it like in a bin and the dump is in Studley Park. You know, you can build in such a way that it in, even enhances the wetland, you know, rehabilitate the, the, the areas so that it becomes, you know, going forward it gets larger, it gets stronger, you know, and so generations, many generations beyond could continue to enjoy those natural heritage of Tobago. The Boko Reef Marine Park is still in the process of being designated an environmentally sensitive area under the Environmentally Sensitive Area Rules 2001. In an effort to preserve what's left, moorings have been placed in specific locations for tour boats to anchor so that corals aren't damaged. The demarcation of the marine park's boundaries and the navigation channel for larger boats were projects completed by the Tobago House of Assembly. I think we should give it its due um, respect and, you know, do everything in our, within our power to protect it. Now, we know there's often a kind of competition between tourism and the natural environment. Like It's a kind of chicken-egg situation because tourism is dependent on the natural environment. But the development of tourism in itself sometimes negatively impacts the, sea, the very natural environment. So we now have to find that middle ground where we can do both things simultaneously and to our benefit. Develop tourism product as well as enhance our natural space. So we need to find that, that and the more heads get coming together in that regard, the better. The protection of the remaining wetlands on the island is vital. A world without wetlands means increased spending to reinforce infrastructure, less food due to the destruction of breeding sites, increase in the price of certain goods, a higher unemployment rate, more severe effects from weather conditions and climate change, greater destruction to coastal communities, and a loss of our natural culture that visitors and future generations will not be able to experience for themselves. It plays such an important role on our island, you know, from the fact that they protect our coastlines to the fact that there are nurseries for fish and people earn their living here. So it's important that we learn that we need to preserve such a treasure. Black, white, red, mangrove crabs, clams, conks, lobster, shrimps, Oysters, fish, wetlands work for us. Black, white, red, mangrove crabs, clams, conks, lobster, shrimps, oysters, fish, wetlands work for us. We have black, white, red, mangrove crabs, conks, lobster, shrimps, oysters, fish, wetlands work for us. We have black, white, Red, mangrove crabs, clams, conks, lobsters, shrimps, oysters, fish, wetlands work for us. We have black, white, red, mangrove crabs, clams, conks, lobsters, shrimps, oysters, fish, 
Petlands would fall.